You're watching Zoo Tours, the channel that takes you on a virtual field trip to the zoo. There really is never a bad day when you visit Chicago's Brookfield Zoo. There are so many unique things to see and do that, if you ask me, it really takes two days to fully appreciate it. And I could spend an entire day inside Tropic World. What looks like a colossal storage facility on the outside contains an unforgettable zoo experience. Tropic World launched gradually in 1982, 83, and 84 for $10 million, claiming to be America's first simulated rainforest in a zoo and the largest zoo building in the world. To this day, it's still talked about so much that you'd think it was a brand new attraction, but because its age hasn't exactly been too kind to it, its massive scale is outweighed by its infamous reputation. But there's still a lot of people out there that say its positives outweigh its negatives. Before we go and see who's right and who's wrong, if this is your very first tour, I recommend please hitting those like, sub, and bell buttons so you can officially be a part of this zoo crew. Tropic World is not hard to find, but to make sure that you're not wandering around this 480 foot long warehouse looking for an entrance, it's located to the right of the swamp building. The main entrance is a windy outdoor trail, but there's plenty to keep you busy while you walk. The series of large signs presents a bit of the building's history and previews several of the species and the environments of the continents that you are about to experience firsthand. I bet you're excited to finally see some animals, right? Fortunately, the building kicks off with a walkthrough exhibit that brings you so close to the animals that you can in fact determine that they are not real. Did I say walkthrough exhibit? Sorry, I meant walkthrough art exhibit. The foyer is pretty much just one giant collage of jungle creatures. It used to look like you were walking through illustrations in a children's book that talked about how primates make choices and these choices can determine life and death in the jungle. Just like how you have a choice as soon as you open these doors. If you were to take a left, not only would you be suspended over Tropic World's first display, but you would be deafened by this roaring waterfall. But let's say the bridge looks like this. The trail does let you bypass behind what Disney cast members call the eighth wonder of the world. Whichever way you go, your next destination is South America, Tropic World's latest phase. It might not be as natural looking as America's other two colossal indoor rainforests, but the size of this one exhibit alone makes its unnatural qualities a little more forgiving. The viewing platform is elevated way up off the ground. So you, initially you might think that there's just no way you're getting close to any of these animals. But while your attention is out there, there are actually creatures right in front of you. I was told this ledge displayed white-headed marmosets. Literally right on the other side of the guest fence are two trees settled on overhanging rocks. I can't remember ever seeing anything calling this one home, but the third one is one of the most entertaining spots in the zoo. And it's a little different from anything else in here. To encourage the animals to join us at the viewing, those vines wrapped around the tree are connected to the building's back wall so they can tightrope over our heads and watch us from the ledges above. A few years ago, this is where I saw Goldie's Marmoset, a monkey that Brookfield was able to breed well, and they were one of the very first zoos in the world to ever do it. But I haven't seen any in my last few trips. But speaking of not showing up, after 10 consecutive annual visits, I finally saw the zoo's sloth. The last time that we all saw a sloth, it was a Lynn's two-toed sloth. But this is a Hoffman's two-toed sloth. They nearly look the exact same, but the Hoffman's has a white ring around their face. That's now two sloths in a row that we came across that wasn't sleeping. So I think I'm safe to say that the curse is finally broken. They were cruising in the slow lane, but their tree mates, cotton top tamarins, do quite the opposite. Despite mentioning golden lion tamarins, who are no longer on display, there's a sign that raises awareness about the zoo's conservation work, 
Specialists at Brookfield have worked with other zoos to maintain a breeding population of 500 tamarins. Some are sent into some sort of boot camp that trains them to forage for food and avoid predators. And if they pass these tests, they are released into protected Brazilian forests. There's about 3,000 golden tamarins in the wild. 400 came from zoos, including Brookfield. That's yet another example that shows how zoos do so much to help wildlife. Everything that lives out here looks like an ant from where we're standing, especially the birds. But there is one large mammal. Look down and you won't miss the giant ant eaters. If you haven't noticed, half of the floor is flooded. It doesn't seem very appropriate for an anteater. I imagine it was mostly for the taper that used to live in here, which is far more aquatic. But there's a lot more to this walking vacuum cleaner than just committing mass ant genocide. Water isn't actually a problem for them. In fact, they're excellent swimmers and use the freestyle stroke to get across wide rivers. And yes, I, I know what you're thinking. They do use that snout as a snorkel. High in the sky, we've got squirrel monkeys with personalities that are far bigger than their actual size. They have so many opportunities to climb, so much space for activities, and yet they make it their goal to pick on the black-handed spider monkeys. These trees allow any primate that isn't us to demonstrate why they belong in trees. But it's so much better when it's a spider monkey. They can't stick to walls or shoot webs, but they do have a tail that's longer than their body. And when their hands and feet are full, it acts like a fifth limb. And it really helps them climb or stay balanced way better than we would if we were just to use our own hands. Oh yeah, the spider monkey name. When they do hang from their tail and just let their arms and legs go limp, they sort of reflect a spider hanging from their web. One of the building's biggest criticisms is that it's been getting more and more empty throughout the years. But I was told that South America will soon, once again, fill this space more with tufted capuchins. Every section of Tropic World has some pretty interesting signage. This one asks you to guess how these four species hold their babies. We hold babies in our arms, squirrel monkeys on their backs, sloths on their chest, and believe it or not, anteaters also carry their young on their backs. A few other interesting things about this is that this is the smallest part of Tropic World. It's completely lit with natural light, and it can turn into an actual rainforest, which we will see in the next section. And that brings us to Asia, nearly two times bigger than South America, but also twice as empty, and without a giant waterfall, it's more than twice as quiet. If you thought it was tough to see those monkeys from a distance, look down because it's even harder to find the Asian small clawed otters. I would know, they still have their own sign, but I haven't seen them since 2018. People can make the case that this building isn't suitable for some species, but I'd believe you if you told me that this was the largest otter exhibit in the world. I even have a zoom shot to give you a good reference on just how much space they actually have. Asia's first featured primate is also a loud one, the northern white-cheeked gibbon. Probably Tropic World's most quick, agile, and fearless creatures. They also have a series of trees that ranges in levels. I imagine it's to reflect a rainforest's emergent layer, canopy, and understory. Some can take them nearly 35 feet in the air. Not even the mega rainforests in New York and Nebraska can say they do that. And like the monkeys next door, these gibbons could probably go their entire lives without ever touching the ground. But with all of this empty space, even your whispers can echo. And with all that reverb, walking in here is like getting a ticket to an opera. Have a listen. This section's right side is modeled after jagged rocks found in Southeast Asia. I've been told that the gibbons can actually swing their way up here, but this exhibit's actual residents can't jump into gibbon territory. The Bornean orangutans. Orangutans aren't necessarily famous for their songs, speed, and athleticism, but who needs all that when you're known as the old wise man of the forest? These intelligent apes are excellent problem solvers, and they use tools to their advantage. In fact, you'll see a sign that talks about peanut butter, 
keepers will stick spoonfuls of peanut butter on the rocks, so it's just out of the orangutan's reach. So these orange apes are encouraged to use sticks to scrape the peanut butter off the rocks, similar to how they would use sticks and twigs in the wild to get insects out of tree hollows. Have you ever wondered how an orangutan stays undetected from predators? Considering how vibrant they are, orange isn't exactly the best camouflage. But one of the zoo's signs explains that orange is the new invisible. If you pull on this image, you'll see that they just slightly disappear in direct sunlight. The signs continue with a list of why gibbons are not monkeys. An orangutan who's who. And just in case you ever see one living alone, the zoo even has a sign that explains this. Eventually you'll read your way to this hut in the corner, and it's nearly boarded up to give what's inside some privacy. In 2022, it was a nocturnal exhibit that looked like this. So it was even more rewarding when I found the pygmy slow lorises. I was a little disappointed to find out that they are no longer here as of 2023. The lights were turned back on and for now, you would find jambu and beautiful fruit tubs. I did mention Tropic World can be an actual rainforest. If you hear a crack of thunder rumble throughout the exhibit, you might see the residents move out of range of a simulated storm. I've never seen it happen in South America, but it's supposed to rain every hour in all three rooms. And don't worry, even though the animals can get wet, you can enjoy the storm and stay completely dry. And that brings us to Africa. Tropic World's very first phase that opened in 1982. But it's also the building's third and final realm in our journey through this concrete jungle. And it's just a little different from the other two rooms. Africa is by far the largest room in Tropic World. And rather than just a simple straight path that parallels the actual exhibit, the viewing kind of lowers you down a bit. So your vantage point is framed with vegetation as you watch the primates climb even higher above your eye line. The biggest difference between Africa and the others is the bridge that takes you through the middle of the displays, giving you a much better angle that you're not used to. While Africa is still abundant in birds, thankfully, it still isn't as full as it once was, losing mandrills, swamp monkeys, pygmy hippos, and even Nile monitors over the years. It's still kept alive with Angolan colobus monkeys and red-tailed guenons. Africa's signs talks all about the importance of poop. It reads, What goes in must come out. Monkeys mostly eat plants, fruits, and seeds as they move throughout the forest. Some of the seeds they eat will pass through undigested in their poop. So essentially their poop is fertilizer, packed with important nutrients and seeds that the forest requires for its regeneration and survival. Even though it's a little empty, there's still more to Africa than just a couple of monkeys and invisible birds. I've only ever seen it once, but it also does have its fair share of downpours. The other side of the bridge is everyone's favorite exhibit. Am I being sarcastic when I say that? Yes and no. For today's standards, this is one of the world's most unusual and interesting gorilla habitats that's still around today. The concrete slabs form a small mountain. Although these are lowland gorillas, I guess it kind of makes sense considering there are mountain gorillas that live in elevated forests. Up until recently, you were able to watch them from literally every angle possible. The guest path looped completely around this exhibit. The elevated portion has been closed for the welfare of the gorilla troop. If I had to guess, I would say the idea was to give them a little bit of privacy and in turn would lower any stress levels they may have had. Fortunately, I've been filming Tropic World for years and have several shots of the exhibit's highest point. I even found some of my old GoPro footage that gives you a better idea of why I'm really going to miss this view. But that's not the only thing I filmed up here. Africa used to have a third exhibit, and if you can believe it, not long ago this was reserved as a second gorilla home, up until black manga bees took over in the late 2010s. Not only can you no longer get close to this, but the windows have since been boarded up. 
Like the orangutans, visitors can identify every single gorilla, learn about the life cycle of a silverback, learn how researchers identify gorillas in the wild by just looking at their nose. And just like us, we are able to see their emotions through facial expressions. And there's even a mirror asking what expression is written on your face. Mine had a mix of comedic sense and disgust after watching a gorilla recycle their own poop. And yep, you just watched that. This was officially 41 years old when this was filmed. I don't think it's anything different from when it first opened. If you're not a fan of this or Tropic World in general, changes are finally coming. It's more than frowned upon to have apes indoors year round. But soon, the entire length of the building's north side will make you forget about all that concrete, with several large naturalistic enclosures for the apes and hopefully the monkeys. Those combined with an indoor habitat that's going to be built on the building's west side will expand Tropic World to a total of three and a half acres. And all of this is scheduled to be completed by 2025. In that, ladies and gents, was arguably the most talked about, the most infamous, and the most divisive attraction in any American zoo. Since it's so hated and loved at the same time, I would really appreciate it if you shared your thoughts on Tropic World. What are its strengths, its weaknesses, and what changes you would make to this exhibit? With this episode, that now means two out of the three mega rainforests in America have been featured on zoo tours. And the third one, will be presented much sooner than you'd think. So please stay tuned. See if you can answer this episode's trivia question. Stay wild and thank you for watching Zoo Tours.